This week, as you are all aware, we have been tuning into Lahiri Mahashaya. Last Thursday, we celebrated his Mahasamadhi, and tomorrow we are going to celebrate his birth anniversary. And in Autobiography of a Yogi, Paramahansa Yogananda writes, by the standards of both qualitative and quantitative good, Lahiri Mahashaya elevated the spiritual level of society. And he even says, Lahiri Mahashaya ranks among the saviors of mankind. And as we all probably read many times in Autobiography of a Yogi, in 1861, Babaji, well, Lahiri was in Raniket, roaming in the woods and the, in the hills, and he heard the voice calling Yahili, Lahiri, and he followed that voice, and there Mahabata Babaji was waiting for him, and that is where uh, Babaji initiated Lahiri into Kriya Yoga, and that's how it is now available to us. But in that conversation, initially, Babaji said, give this Kriya only to qualified people who are ready to renounce everything. And Lahiri said, well, can you please relax that requirements? Because you know, not everyone or most people are not ready to um, renounce, you know, first. But, uh, well, that's what he said. He said, they need special encouragement. <laughs> Otherwise, they will not even try. And then Babaji said, the divine wish has been expressed through you. Give Kriya freely to, um, give Kriya freely to all who humbly ask for help. That is, again, how we, today, we get to learn and practice the sacred technique of Kriya Yoga. And after that encounter, Babaji, however, told Lahiri to go back to the world. And I mean, Babaji said, you must mingle in the world of men, serve as an example of the ideal yogi householder. And Lahiri, though he wanted to stay with Babaji in the Himalayas, but he went back, he worked, he continued to work as an accountant for another 25 years. Imagine you experience Nyobhikalpa Samadhi and you go back to office and be there for another 25 years. <laughs> and, but nonetheless, he did that, and he continued also at the same time teaching Kriya Yoga in his house in a small corner of that uh, city of Varanasi. And if you look at the backdrop of that time when he lived, it was the dawn of the new age. This Swami Sri Yukteswar, According to Swami Sri Yukteswar's calculation, from 1700 to 1900 was a transition period between two yugas, from Kali Yuga to Dwapara. And the Dwapara proper started in 1900. So when Lahiri got Kriya in 1861 and he continued spreading Kriya Yoga till the day of his Mahasamadhi in 1895. Uh, that was that second half of 1800. That was the period when, you know, the consciousness of the mankind was slowly changing, getting ready for the new age. In Kali Yuga it was almost impossible to pursue or to seek God if you stay in the world. If you want God, leave everything, go to the Himalayas and seek God there. But Dwapara Yuga is not that. As we are doing today, 
we are able to seek God in the middle of the crowd of men. And so Lahiri Babaji gave Lahiri that role, that mission, to demonstrate that is possible. To live in the world, fulfilling one's worldly duties, and at the same time, seek God and realize God. You can seek, we can seek God wherever we are because it's not about outer renunciation. It is about inner renunciation. Do we live with the consciousness of God? Do we place God first in our life? Whatever we do or wherever we are, that's the question, that's the the assignment we are given. There is a story of Sukhdeva and King Janaka. Yoganandaji said Lahiri Mahashaya was previously King Janaka. So maybe this is also appropriate to share. But one day, uh, King Janaka told his young disciple Sukhdeva, um, he said, Okay, you come and hold these two oil lamps in your hands, one in each hand, and it's filled, the, the oil is filled to the brim. And the king said, now, go around my palace, go to every single room holding these two lamps, don't spill oil, not even a drop, and then come back. So Sukhdeva took that challenge. He carried very carefully. After two hours, he came back and said, yes, I didn't drop any. I didn't spill any. And the king asked, OK, good. So what did you see? Tell me what everything you saw. And Sukhdeva is like, I was so concentrated on the on the lamps and oil, I didn't see anything. The king said, well, go back <laughs> once again. See everything. And at the same time, don't spill any oil. Sukhdeva went again. After 10 hours, he came back. <laughs> <laughs> This time, though, he was not excited. He was very calm. And he did not spill any drop. And he was able to describe every single detail that King asked about every room. So this is what we have to do in this world. Keep our focus on God. No spilling. <laughs> And at the same time, perform our God-given duties with full attention, full awareness, even with willingness. This is the assignment of this age. And it applies to every one of us. We emphasize Lahiri Mahashaya as a householder but probably he was not an ordinary householder. <laughs> and what is important in this is that he probably didn't identify himself as a householder. It didn't matter in the sense that it, it didn't mean that he neglected his duty, but it, it didn't matter in the sense that it did not affect his consciousness because his priority was clear. God, inner communion with God. So outward definitions didn't and shouldn't affect that priority. And that applies to us too. 
At Ananda, um, I guess most of you are householders. Some are single, and very few renounce it. And God placed us in a particular situation, circumstances, place, family, profession. And all of us have different circumstances, different tests, because we have different karma. But when we meet, gather together, we connect instantly because we share that same priority in life, the same purpose in life, to find God, to love God, to live for God. Jesus Christ said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It is about the heart. It's not about what our definition, outward definition is, or what our action is. Wherever we are, whatever we do, and whomever we are with, all we want to be is to be an, an instrument of the divine and to live that life, that to, to show, to share our love for God, our purpose in life with everyone we meet. And that's what these great masters and Mahiri Mahashaya is also telling us. Om Guru. I'll also share a few stories which has, from Larry Mashaya's life which has inspired me. So the first story is about how he followed uh, his own heart and how he lived according to the truth within and did not follow the opinions of the society at that point of time. So Larry Mashaya was a Brahmin and all the majority of his students were from the same community. But uh, Ram Prasad Jaiswal was an advocate who was not a Brahmin. And he also came and was a part of the satsang with the um, everyday satsang at Larry Mashaya's house. At some point, one of his uh, relative disciples opposed, they, they said, uh, we, we just cannot accept this. We cannot sit next to him. So Larry Mashaya immediately said that, Jaiswal, why don't you come sit with me? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody learned their lesson. And another time, uh, this story is about how, uh, inspired me about how we should face uh, our karma. So generally when something difficult is in front of us, our first response is, how can we dodge it? It's natural, nothing wrong, thinking like that. But at some point, we'll have to address, and at some point, we'll have to face it and rise above that challenge. Um, every day, Krishna Ram, another disciple of Larry Mahashaya, would accompany Larry Mahashaya from his home to the Rana Mahal Ghat in Varanasi, and both of them would uh, go together. He will have a dip at Holy Ganga, walk back to, at the, in the early hours, hours of hours in the morning. And one one day when he was walking down the lane, he asked his disciple uh, Krishna Ram, uh, Krishna Ram, tear a piece of cloth for me. And Krishna Ram couldn't comprehend why what. Why is he saying? And before he could understand and ask, when Larry Mashaya took few steps ahead of him, a brick from a terrace from on, uh, fell on his foot and his, his toe was bleeding. And then he turns to Krishna Ram and asks, can you now tear a piece of cloth and tie this? <laughs> so he said, he asked Krishna Ram, asked, Babu, if you know that brick is going to fall, why don't you save yourself? And Larry Mashaya answered, if I had avoided it, I would have to suffer the pain with interest at some other time. 
I have to receive what is destined. Therefore, the earlier, the better. So that gives us the courage to face the challenges in front of us instead of avoiding. Another time, uh, Chandra Mohan Day was a practicing uh, physician. He always came to Larry Mashaya for blessings. He went to Larry Mashaya for blessings before he took the medical exam. He graduated and he came back for blessings. And Larry Mashaya was conversing with him about the state of the art infrastructures, which are, you know, the new discoveries then. And then finally asked him, so how do you define death? How does a doctor, uh, you know, what's there in your textbook? So he went ahead and explained, well, we check for pulse, we check for, you know, the pupil dilation, the breath, heartbeat, and if it, nothing is available, I mean, is. Uh, no physical signs are there, then we pronounce him as dead. Okay, then why don't you check me right now? <laughs> <laughs> and he checked his pulse, pupil dilation, heartbeat, nothing was there. And then Larry Mashaya said, why don't you issue me a death certificate right now? <laughs> And this was not when he was meditating or when he was in Samadhi. This is how he carried on his daily chores. This is the state he was in when he was having a conversation. That's the exalted state he was. And he lived as an example at just to convey the fact, although he did not have to be born, he came and he was born for us just to be an example of how we should live as a householder or a renunciate it doesn't matter just root stay rooted in god is what his message was and the other story which i'm going to share is how available lahiri mashaya is to all his disciples to all his devotees once uh hitlal sarkar was a brick layer i, I mean he was working in a brick field in kolkata somewhere in West Bengal. One day he had an intense pang that he has to go somewhere. He had no idea why, he had no idea where. So he just w started walking and then he reached the Howrah railway station and then he reached the ticket counter and asked, give me a ticket. And obviously the guy behind the counter asked, to where? Where to? He said, I don't know. Here is the money. Just give some ticket, anywhere. So the railway uh, person thought that okay, this person is really disturbed. Perhaps go, if he goes to Kashi, it, he would be, you know, and have the darshan of Kashi Vishwanath, he would have uh, a blessing. He would come back to his senses. And he asked about Kashi, and this money which you have given me is enough. Can I give a ticket there? He said, okay. So he got down at the railway station in Kashi. He didn't know where to go. He just started walking. But he was tired by now because he has spent all his ticket on the, I mean, money on the ticket. And almost very, very tired when he was meandering through a narrow street, Larry Mashaya stepped out of the home and called him, Hey, Hitlal, come here. And mm -hmm. he said, How does he know my name? Who is he? And he walked he, uh, to him and asked, who are you? He said, I'll explain everything later. Go freshen up, rest, have food. And then after that, he was the Larry Mashaya called him and said, it is I who called you. It's a strange way of calling, but he did call. And the disciple did receive, you know, was receptive to his call. The receptivity counts. As Paramahansa Yogananda says that just like a the, a flower's fragrance cannot be contained, even if it is hidden, like that Lahiri Mahashaya's fame, you know, was spreading all throughout India, even if he was not advertising and he was very humbly living in a small uh, house at Banaras. But how many of those bees, how many of those people followed the fragrance and went to him is the question. And all our gurus are available to bless us. They are blessing us. How much are we able to receive is the question. Once Abhoya, another disciple, 
uh, again started to, towards uh, Kashi from Kolkata, but then she was late. And as she and her husband entered the railway station, they heard the train whistling and leaving the platform to Kashi. And then she immediately prayed to Lahiri, to Lahiri Mahashaya asking, I cannot wait another day. And the train was moving, I mean, in the sense the engine was functioning, but the wheel was rotating, but the train didn't move. It was there. And all the engineers, engine, I mean, the driver stepped down and they were just looking at it, not knowing what to do. And as soon as these guys got the ticket and boarded the train, the train started to move. And when Abhoya reached uh, Lairi Mahashaya and tried to get her blessing, he smiled and said, how do you love to trouble me? Can't you just wait another day? <laughs> That's how Lairi Mahashaya, at a distant, but yet could hear the call of every devotee. And he would be hearing our call our prayers, the faith should be there. And one last story is one of his, uh, one of his devotees, another woman, asked for a picture of Lairi Mahashaya. And then he, uh, when he gave the, his photograph to her, he said, if this is my photograph, if you deem it a protection, then it is so. Otherwise, it's only a picture. And when they hung that picture in the wall, and in front of it, she and her daughter-in-law were reading Bhagavad Gita, and there was a lightning, an electrical thunderstorm, and the lightning struck the Bhagavad Gita book, but they were saved at such a close quarters. And they said that it was as though a shield of ice covered them, uh, protected them from the heat and the power of lightning. So as soon as she prayed to Lairi Mahashaya's photograph, he responded. As soon as Master's mother prayed to Lairi Mahashaya, from his photograph came a brilliant, radiant white, a light which enveloped the whole room and healed Paramahansa Yogananda from his cholera. So it is the power of the yogi or power of the guru is not, need not be questioned. All the photographs here we have in front of us can be deemed as pictures or a source of inspiration and power. It's up to us. So let's cultivate that faith and look at, call on to the masters and always remember what Paramahansa Yogananda said, to those who think me near, I am near. Let's think them near.